first meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. The first item on the agenda is a decision on whether to take agenda item four, consideration of a draft stage one report on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill in private at the meeting and in future, do members agree to do so? The next item on the agenda today is an evidence session with Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary to the meeting and also Jonathan Price, the Scottish Government's Director for Culture, Tourism and Major Events, David Sears, the Head of Sponsorship and Funding, and Claire Tint Irvin, Deputy Director of the International Division. Now, I understand, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you're not making an opening statement. Happy to move straight okay, into questions. Thanks very much. Um, well, in, in our uh, letter to you, um, we outlined uh, uh, the priorities of the committee in, in terms of the budget and uh, one of those priorities was obviously the screen sector which we spent a lot of time last year uh, uh, looking at in our uh, inquiry and you addressed that in your response uh, to the committee's letter but there, there have been developments of course uh, since then uh, notably in terms of the um, the events in, in Edinburgh in terms of the Palamas uh, studio. I wonder if you could give us any updates uh, on, on that and also your views on the other proposal announced yesterday by the private sector for a film studio mm. in Middle Odeon. Um, well, obviously very pleased to, to see the, the developments. Uh, we knew that we were very close to being able to uh, make announcements in relation to the, the tender for the operation of a studio at Palamas. Uh, I think it's also uh, I think worth reiterating that we've always said that there's room for more than one studio in Scotland and there's a capacity for that. We've obviously got the Ward Park developments that you're familiar with. Um, in relation to uh, Palamas, obviously in terms of uh, that operation, the size of it, the scale of it, um, the opportunities that they've already had in terms of uh, the relations with the film industry. Indeed, I think it was last summer I met with a delegation um, of uh, you know, um, American film producers that were scouting out different areas and looking at where they might uh, want to, to do future business. They'd seen War Park, they'd also seen Palamas, they'd seen other areas. Um, uh, the tender uh, to, for the operation of that uh, is due to complete in uh, uh, February with some announcements in, in March. Again, uh, to reiterate, uh, the private sector involvement in this is, is absolutely critical. Uh, so therefore, the, the work with four ports authorities has been very important and that's been part of the discussions. The uh, overall lease will be taken over by Screen Scotland, but the operation of that lease and the tender for the operation of the studio uh, is, is what it's out for tender. Um, clearly, the uh, Pentland proposal, there was an announcement just recently in terms of, in terms of application for um, uh, another location. Uh, obviously, that's part of a planning process, and as you'd understand as a minister, um, I wouldn't necessarily be able to go into to those aspects. But I think things are looking healthy uh, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the prospects for a film studio. And in terms of investment, we're at a very strong level. I understand in terms of investment, investment operation the screen, screen Scotland is currently working with 25 different productions um, and so therefore that's uh, I suppose an update on both studios but also I think on the spend aspects in terms of uh, ensuring that some of the, the the additional funding we managed to secure last year is now starting to be used in relation to um, not just attracting films here but also very importantly uh, supporting indigenous productions as well and I'm delighted that we're going to see the uh, premiere of Mary Queen of Scots uh, next week in uh, Scotland and uh, I think uh, uh, if I'm allowed as the MSP from Lithgow to say that that's a, a great opportunity not just for the screen and the culture side but also from the tourism aspect for Scotland. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, just to drill down on that, can you give us any indication of where we are in terms of tenders uh, for the Palamas building? I mean, what kind of interest has there been? I, I mean, that's not that's an operational matter that Screen Scotland is um, is uh, you know they're, they're responsible for, and I I, I, mean, I don't think it would be correct for me to to release any information I have, and actually I don't have the information as to who's tendered as yet. Right, okay. Uh, we have some supplementaries, I think, from Jamie Green on the subject of screen, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. So, can I just, uh, turning to the numbers uh, in your response to us, uh, it states that the this year's budget will provide a further 10 million doubling in effect to 20 from 10. So, just to confirm, that that will be 20 million pounds allocated to Screen Scotland this financial year, is that yes. right? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, and, and, and as was last year as well. Okay. And uh, I just wonder if you could maybe uh, elicit a little bit more from you in terms of what you think that doubling will provide or what sort of outcomes that we should expect from it because yeah. it's a, obviously a, a well it's, it's part of the overall ambition that was set out in the screen leadership uh, group report to uh, double the amount of production spend uh, that we want to, you know, to see in Scotland but also to grow production companies we want to see um, uh, uh, an improvement in the numbers of production companies that are operating at scale. Um, so that's the overall strategic aim. In relation to some of the areas, we've now got a number of uh, uh, funds that are in operation, the Production Growth Fund, uh, for example, and we've seen uh, an increase, and the latest figures had shown an increase um, um, by 26 million up to 90, uh, I think it's about 92 or 95 million in terms of, I think it's 95 million in terms of production spend. So we're already seeing that, that progress with some very big productions. Outlaw King, obviously, since we've probably last met, has now been uh, released, and obviously the impact of that across Netflix is, is very strong. But importantly, the, the amount of spend that had, particularly for um, crew production, etc., was very strong indeed. Uh, we're also seeing, in terms of television spend, in terms of um, uh, announcements, in terms of funding for, for that, the partnerships that I think everybody recognised could happen with the, the different production companies, um, that's uh, in operation. They're, they're scaling up in terms of their staffing, because that's part of what you know, I know this committee has taken a keen interest in, so the recruitment of that is very strong indeed. But it's, it's obviously the combination of, um, yes, inward uh, attraction for um, films to locate here in terms of the filming, uh, but also very much in terms of the um, uh, trying to help Indigenous as well. So I think that's, I know the, this is an area that the committee has taken a keen interest in, and I think we can work with you, and, and obviously with you'll want to speak to Screen Scotland at some point, what would be the appropriate time for them to give you a good account of what the progress has been to date. Thank you for that. It's a very um, comprehensive answer, and much of that is, is very welcome. Um, I, I guess uh, given that staffing is on the increase, often as, as is the case when an agency grows, is that the staffing cost also grows. And uh, I, I guess the industry is asking is, will this additional funding provide any real opportunities for additional uh, support for, for uh, small independent pr production companies, uh, in the, the sense that it won't all be swallowed up in a, in a a growth uh, within the administrative costs of the agency itself? Uh, absolutely, that's what we'd be expecting, is to make sure that there's uh, a growth in the production companies. Uh, obviously, we're looking for scale, because that's one of the key aspects for... Because uh, currently, we've only got uh, two companies that are probably in the top 50 in terms of um, the actual scale of what they do, and we want to grow that from two to six, I think, is the, the target and the leadership group. But I think your point about how do we help small pr um, independent producers is really critical, and we can do that in a number of ways, certainly through um, the work of Screen Scotland um, operating, but also in the challenges with uh, BBC uh, through Ofcom and, and the work this committee will do and my meetings with Ofcom, and I'm very pleased with the, um, the, the most recent reports from Ofcom about the importance of trying to make sure that you have genuinely... Um, you have genuine spend that is actually for uh, Indigenous Scottish companies to grow. I think that's a, that's a, that's an area. I think also with the Channel Four commissioning, that will help in that area as well. So for me, in terms of my discussions uh, with uh, Creative Scotland and Screen Scotland, I'm very keen to make sure that this is about the development of the sector, uh, because that's one thing we can do. Is we creative content will come from the creatives, but in terms of enabling the creative industries and the actual businesses to grow, that's a, a critical aspect of what we need to see happen. OK, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, to follow on the questions around the screen sector, the report that the committee did last year made some strong recommendations around the role of Scottish Enterprise and expressed our concerns um, about their involvement in the, in the screen unit. Could you perhaps... We also made recommendations that the budget should be moved from Scottish Enterprise over to the screen unit within Creative Scotland. Um, also, that's, the, I think, the responsibility of a different Cabinet Secretary. But if the Cabinet Secretary this morning could maybe give us an update on that relationship. So, uh, I think there has actually been correspondence with the committee explaining some of the, the developments with the MOU with Scottish Enterprise, um, but also in relation to some of the um, actual activities. One of the business development initiatives is, is something called FOCUS. Um, and that, again, in terms of the um, autumn area, that's the, that, that has been developed. Um, and in terms of that was happening, I think some of the activity around that uh, over the summer. You've also then got the, uh, the 
the screen committee that is also then kind of help, which I think is, a, is absolutely critical with the screen expertise and the industry expertise to, to help ensure that the um, activities that are driven both by enterprise, by skills development Scotland, and by everybody else um, is, is you know is, is 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 operational and working well. The regional selective assistance. Selective Assistance Programme is one of the key areas where um, Scottish Enterprise has been investing. Um, and of course, I'm not sure that you'd necessarily agree that the creative industries aspect of regional selective assistance should move into my budget. So I think this is the point about the cooperation rather than necessarily the budget move. I know that the committee is keen for a budget move. But if you look at um, two companies um, that um, I've got an interest in and I've, I've visited, I've seen the, the investment. You've got Axis um, Animations who are developing, have increased um, staffing. They've had funding regional assistance. Um, to help develop and grow their staff. They are particularly looking in animation side to look at how they can then work to, for example, global theme parks. If you look at how, I mean, everything is digital now in terms of presentations, and there's real um, opportunities for them to develop in that area. Uh, Blazing Griffin is a company that I visited that received election, uh, regional selective assistance. They were behind the Anna and the Apocalypse, that, you know, the, the, um, the Christmas hit that came out and was also at the Edinburgh International Festival. And again, that's the combination of bringing different skills together and it's an enhanced graphic um, aspect that Scotland is very, very good at. So there is that kind of um, the the uh, initial business development side, but there's also the kind of point about identifying what support can be given to grow numbers of jobs. And that's obviously uh, Scottish Enterprise area as well. So we're not shifting budgets, which I, I know the committee wants to see. That's not happened. Um, but you know, there's a much, much closer working uh, even the operational operation, I suppose the operationalization of that. Um, since the, the, the summer period. And that's something that I know the committee will keep a, a keen interest in, but it's not necessarily a budget scrutiny issue because we haven't transferred the budget. That's more about the, what Scottish Enterprise do. But I'm sure our colleagues in Scottish Enterprise and indeed um, with the Cabinet Secretary for, for uh, the economy in that area, that's something that you might want to pursue separately. But I don't know that that's a specific issue for a budget scrutiny session. Thank you. Um, can I turn to local authority funding? Um, last year, when the committee took evidence around the Creative Scotland funding decisions, uh, we did then look at broader issues around funding for uh, the whole creative sector. And does the cabinet sector acknowledge that the cuts being experienced by local government leaves cultural organisations quite vulnerable? They don't come under statutory protection in, in many areas. And the evidence we received from, um, from creative groups were that they were running out of options for funding. It was very tight at local government level. Um, they, they felt there wasn't enough funding within Creative Scotland to meet the demand that's there, something that Creative Scotland has recognised, although they acknowledged that they are receiving um, a, a settlement that is reflective of previous years. But the demand out there is, is so great, they are struggling to meet that demand. Okay. And local authorities aren't able to pick up um, that provision. There's also been ex concerns expressed around uh, impact on libraries, impact on sports centres, all these uh, types of areas. Um, and uh, we, yeah. later on, on the, that we got from the, the cabinet sector on the 19th, you had said that you'd be happy to talk, yeah, speak about local yeah. authority budgets in more detail. Uh, well, there, obviously, in terms of this budget scrutiny for 1920, local uh, government is receiving uh, a real terms increase, and I think that's an issue that obviously other committees will be looking at in relation to scrutiny with the cabinet secretary for. Um, uh, finance and also local government. Um, I'm not going to underestimate that there aren't pressures everywhere. There are pressures everywhere, but it's a, a it's, it's an, an issue of what choices, uh, particularly individual local authorities, but also different tiers of government take. You know, as, you as we are presenting the budget here, um, you're seeing that, the, as you said, that a lot of it's very similar to levels last year, but that was a 10% increase for culture. So we as a, gov we as a government, the Scottish government, at our level of government, made a, a decision, uh, despite the pressures that we had and the real terms cuts that we've had um, over a period since 2010-11, that we would make sure that we um, provided a 10% increase. And that was a £6.6 .6 million uh, increase for Creative Scotland in particular. And that's been transferred, as you said, into, into this year's um, funding. Uh, that, so don't underestimate that that's a conscious choice. Now, what you also identify, though, that all that does is help plug a gap from national lottery that Creative Scotland has, so that Creative Scotland's overall spend doesn't necessarily increase. It's allowing them to maintain what they have been doing. But I do think we should um, look at what's been happening at local government, because I think that's very important. And um, in terms of 
uh, partnership. A lot of funding tends to be in relation to, you know, if you get funding from one aspect, you can then have uh, match funding from different other areas. So it is quite, I'm not, you know, it can be quite fragile, I recognise that. But also, I don't want to perpetuate um, some kind of idea that somehow um, culture has been decimated at local authority level, when actually, if you look at the figures, and I would encourage the, the committee to look at the, the poll figures, the, 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 the public figures that are available, and what's happening in that area. Because um, despite, and you, you mentioned libraries, well, actually, there's been, uh, compared to the rest of the UK, uh, actually, uh, much less reduction in Scotland than anywhere else. The big, I suppose, dare I say, uh, big impact was in Labour Run 5 in 2017 when there was um, uh, you know, a considerable number, I think it was upwards of 16, I think there's another three this year, but that was the major cut in terms of libraries, because actually in Scotland it's been a handful ever since. And because, again, conscious decision by th this government is we've maintained our non-national library funding to help slick the Scottish Library's information service. We've been transforming and helping support digitisation, transforming of, of, of public libraries from the, the limited funds we have um, to help them meet the 21st century. And that's I think that's helped Scottish Library's been ahead of the curve and that's been recognised elsewhere. But to get to your point, and I know this is quite a long answer, convener, but I think it's really, really important. If you look at the provisional outturn for 1718 and you look at the budget estimates for 1819, if you look overall at the figures, now remember, if you look at the, these lines for local government, they put culture and heritage, library services, tourism, recreation and sport all together. And that is what comes under the term culture and related services. So if you looked at the overall figures, then you'll see between the provisional outturn from 1617 to 1718, there was a 3% reduction. And then budget estimates um, would have, uh, for between 1718 and 1819, would have a 2% reduction. Okay. But if you break that down to the different areas, if you look at library services, there actually was, in terms of the budget estimates between 17 and 18 and 18, 19 percent, a 1 percent increase. Um, if you look at uh, culture and heritage, it was flat line. If you look at recreation and sport, that goes down. That's not part of my you know, responsibility, that's the sport. If you look at tourism, if you look at tourism, um, in terms of uh, uh, promotional events increased, uh, but also but significantly by 15%, but other tourism in, uh, decreased by 18% in terms of provisional outturn. And then if you look at the next year pro projection into, uh, into budget estimates, there's a 10% reduction. So what I'm saying is if you look at the, um, the, the uh, I suppose, the grouping that comes under cultural related services, there, there looks as if there's a reduction by 2%. But actually within that, it's tourism that's had the major reduction. Um, so I'm not disputing that if you look at you know, look at this, there's a there's a challenge there. But I think we it's worth taking the time, probably not not the time I've got here, is to look at that within within that because I don't want some kind of um, uh, you know narrative that somehow says there's been a reduction in culture spend in Scotland when we as a government have increased have managed to actually and it's recognised internationally and also across the UK we've managed to to really protect our budget at national level and indeed last year increase it by 10 percent but even if you look at if you look at the real terms reduction that we as a government have had since 2010-11 as as a national uh, nationally uh, even local local government because I think local government value culture and they understand it and they, they do want to try and protect it, that has not been um, uh, comparative to what we've had at a national level. So I, I do think that, you know, it's, I'm not saying there isn't a challenge and there will be a challenge going forward, but let's let's do it on an evidence base as opposed to what people's perceptions. Kavira, I'm really sorry that was a long answer, but you did write to me on this issue and I think it is a, a, key, a key aspect. Yeah, just to point, um the other thing I was going to ask about was you had written to us about the local authority conveners group that that hadn't been meeting. And I would say that you can point to examples, you know, within my own region, the refurbishment of the Carnegie Library Museum, which is a fantastic project, a huge investment from all the partners involved. So I do recognise that is investment in culture and local authorities are making positive decisions. But I don't think, you know, you recognise that our challenges, I don't think it can be denied that it's an area that is vulnerable. Um, it doesn't have the same protection as other services that local authorities have to deliver on a statutory basis. So have the local authority conveners group, has that convened? Does it, and if it hasn't been convened, why, what do you think the issues yeah. are, why that's not been operational? Yeah, and, and, and I just also want to acknowledge that, you know, when you've, you've got pressured budgets, those areas aren't statutory, are obviously 
you know, it's, it, it takes strong leadership, both at local government and national government, to try and try and to protect those budgets. Um, our, our officials have been trying to, uh, you know, uh, agree with COSLA the setting up of this uh, conveners group again. Um, remember, the last time it happened was at my initiative, because the last time I, I remember going to a meeting of the communities group and I asked of the 32 local the conveners there how many are responsible for culture. Only three were. The rest could because it was grouped in with housing and other areas. So a lot of it is, I think, it's determined by the way COSLA organises itself. They themselves internally have rearranged how they run their budget streams and who are the leads for different. different different um, areas or different uh, responsibilities. I, I just think it's taken a time for uh, COSA to settle after, obviously, the elections from 2017 into what their internal structures are. Um, I also think, I understand that perhaps the lead for this area has been, you know, has been on maternity leave, so therefore they might be waiting until that, um, you know, that resolves and she, she, she returns. So I don't know, I don't want to, to say anything as to, to what the reasons might be. We're keen for it to happen, but I can't make them do something. They've got to do it at their own pace and time. But I, I think if, it, if you know, we can communicate to them that this committee he thinks it's a good thing that that happens, then I'd be very keen for it to establish, especially where a lot of the issues that we're, we're seeing are really place-based. And I'll give another example. There's a um, city deals. I'm very pleased that there's been a, a strong recognition of the need for um, culture and tourism spend within the city deals. And I remember these aren't, that doesn't appear in my budget. It will appear um, in the, the, the budgets where uh, city deals will, um, you know, in terms of infrastructure and other areas. But I think it's really important that we have uh, good relationships with local government in these areas. So I tend to have more bilateral relations. Um, obviously, Dundee clearly, in terms of the leader of Dundee Council, I met with the culture lead for Aberdeen fairly recently. Whenever I'm on my visits, I, I try and make sure that I'm meeting with the, the culture lead for those different um, areas. But I'm very pleased if you look at, you know, Tay Cities, for example, and in terms of its deal, the Ed Number one as well, the place partnership, the impact um, concert hall, which we're also helping fund. There's the strong um, culture and tourism spend in the city deals, which won't appear as part of my budget. But again, we need to have good relationships bilaterally with local authorities to ensure that we've got a common understanding as to what would really make a difference um, in that area. Okay, thanks very much. We've got quite a few members still to get through, so if I could politely ask for succinct answers. Thank you. Uh, Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to turn to the external affairs budget. Um, there's obviously been some significant increases there around international relations that, that I would certainly welcome. When the committee recently visited Brussels, it was very clear from uh, Scottish government officials there that there was going to be a need to essentially spend more to stand still given the, the uh, situation with Brexit. How is the increased uh, budget allocated to the Brussels office going to be evaluated in that context, it'd be unfortunate to reach this time next year and there have uh, there to be a, a perception that there's been no added value from the added budget, uh, given the external factors and, and what we very clearly heard during our visit, that there's simply going to need to be more spend to continue doing what we're already doing. Well, in terms of the level four in Brussels, you've, you've got an increase from 1.6 to um, 2 million. Um, we're also, um, in terms of outlining our uh, spend in other offices, you've seen that in Paris, for example, which is, uh, is now a budget line that has come out of the uh, European strategy budget. That now exists. Um, you refer to the increase in uh, the external affairs budget. Dare I say, you know, I'd like to welcome it as spend on operational issues, but I'll, I'll, I think we have to recognise that the spend and the increase, if you look at the line, it's external uh, affairs advice and policy of six million is actually a recognition of the change that the, the parliament and the committees asked for from overall budgets that we're looking at total operating costs and corporate costs. So staffing issues um, for that whole portfolio, every single portfolio we're now doing this, is you're seeing the you're seeing that that be more explicit in terms of budget lines. So that's what that is. So I'll, be, I'll uh, I'm afraid uh, unlike the Daily Mail and uh, I think it was uh, Adam Tomkins, who I think is on the Finance Committee, obviously doesn't realise that you know that, that change in budgeting lines means that you know. You We've actually got staffing more up front as well as the contribution to the overall government costs. So I'm saying actually in terms of our spent, there is variation between the lines. In terms of your point about capacity, because the external affairs uh, budget, apart from international development and humanitarian aid, which is clearly, um, that is a delivery line, uh, delivering services, this is staffing. And so clearly we have not just started working on some of the issues about leaving the EU. That's been a huge, um, a, a huge focus for the, the members of staff. 
in, that, in, in our area and responsibility for some years now, but that's now more explicit. I think the other point that the committee was interested in is business plans. So one of the things we're going to be doing is developing um, the business plans for each of the um, offices, and that will also be published at some point. But and I know that will be an interest for the for the committee, but that's not not in immediate. But they are in preparation. Thanks. And just on that point around um, evaluation of the, the Brussels office in particular, I mean, it applies ac across the network of offices, but Brussels in particular, um, how will the government um, change the how, evaluation of, of how much value for money it is, given the, the context of, of post, potentially post-Brexit UK? Well, I, I, Brussels was always important in trying to influence, um, obviously, uh, decisions that were made by decision takers. Um, you know, the, the the shift in leaving the EU means that you know uh, both the UK actually the UK's perm, permanent office there, and also um, the, the Scotland's Brussels office will still have an absolutely vital and important role. It's just that they won't necessarily be able to be influencing decisions of ministers that will be taking part as members of council. It will they'll end up being more lobbying you know, in terms of trying to persuade. So you know, that's more difficult and more challenging. But you know we know that the, whatever happens in terms of the eventualities, we need to have a strong presence. So we have have improved and increased um, our representation there. I think the committee, I hope, has, has visited and has met the, the team that are there. Um, it might be a change of focus of what they do and, and more the impact and the, the influence that they can have. Uh, but in terms of the evaluation of that, it is, you know, do we build the relationships that we have? I've, I've always said that this portfolio is about relationships, in fact, in culture as well as in, in, in this area. And it's the strength and how you evaluate your uh, relationships. It's not necessarily in a financial terms, it's actually in policy terms. So when we look at the business plans, and that's why I'm saying that in terms of these areas, it's how do you evaluate the, you know, the power of influence um, and, uh, and relationships is not necessarily in, in monetary terms. It's actually in how you, so that's, that, I mean, to me, that's, that, that, that's how we want to evaluate it. Um, and just one uh, relatively minor point of, of uh, clarification that would be useful. There's a um, decrease in the budget allocated to the um, office in Washington, D.C. Is that, that is presumably proportionate with the fact that the uh, Canadian office is in a separate budget line? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and just finally, um, Cabinet Secretary, the um, Scottish Connections uh, budget line that's now there, could you explain that a little bit from the kind of brief description that, that I've seen of it already? It was not entirely clear what exactly this was referring to. Some of the language around it sounded like the kind of things that um, SDI, for example, is, is already doing and, and would be allocated for elsewhere. Well, one of the things we are doing, and particularly with our offices, is to make sure there's a greater um, synergy and connection and, again, value we can get in working with SDI um, in, in terms of some of the activities. Scottish Connections uh, will, for example, there's about 140,000 supporting uh, strategies to do with engagement with a global network of organisations that we want to work with. That, again, helps our, um, I suppose, our cultural diplomacy, our networking activities uh, internationally. Uh, but importantly, there's um, half a million of that is actually the international marketing team that was in another budget elsewhere in terms of the work that they do. Scotland is now, you'll be familiar with, um, is how we're trying to bring together, you know, University of Scotland, the private sector, uh, tourism, SDI, in a, 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 you know, a collective promotion uh, uh, for Scotland, but also attraction of talent, investment, etc. So that's what that, that budget by and large is doing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, Alexander Stewart, you also had questions in this particular Thank line. Thank you. We've already discussed the... Uh, ideas of the development of the footprint of offices across uh, and uh, Rossview has already indicated the one in Washington and we've got the one in, in Paris and the one in China uh, and, and they, come, they seem to come from different lines within the Budget Cabinet Secretary. Some seem to come out of the international affairs whereas our, our ones in, in Dublin and Berlin and London seem to come out of the finance economies budget. So can we have some clarity as to why there's the, the differential between that? Uh, if I want to be, I suppose it's pragmatic because in pressured budgets we try and make sure we work in partnership and because the focus for the, our international offices is uh, to encourage people to, you know, to live, work, study and invest in Scotland as well as uh, ensuring we've got good lines of communication with, with other governments and key policy areas, it's actually effective use of government resources and so that's, that's the rationale as to why that's been put, put together. I think it's also a good way of us working together in, in terms of our promotion but there is investment from this, you know, different, different lines in terms of support for example in Dublin we also fund uh, in relation to that as well but you know, it's effectively getting best value for the public purse by bringing together budgets for best effect. And 
obviously, the run-up to Brexit, there's been lots of discussion about what these officers are trying to achieve and to ensure that we still have the captured footprint and we're still uh, negotiating and making sure that Scotland's presence is being, is being managed. Uh, can I ask about the, the external affairs budget and how it is addressing the outcomes that Brexit may give us and the opportunities and the challenges that face us? the outcomes that Brexit might bring us. I, if, we, if anybody in this room can predict what that will be tomorrow or the next day or ever next week, that would be welcome. Um, but in the spirit, I think, with which it's been asked, is we, we don't know. I mean, that's the whole point. So therefore, going back to the point, answer to, to Ross Greer, we've just got, we've got to make sure we've got the strength, the presence, the relationships to, to be able to either mitigate the worst disasters of this or to find navigate a way through. And that's what we have to do. And we've got a very good team that do that. And we also... Um, you know, I, th I think it is important to reflect that they we do also work um, positively and constructively with the UK government where we can in different places, including, you know, I was recently in the Netherlands um, and met with the, the UK ambassador there, as well as the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. I happened to be with them the day that Theresa May pulled the vote on the, the meaningful vote, which was a bit embarrassing for them as well as us, and to see what was happening in relation to the UK government. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, w you know when we do work with, with others, uh, you know, the UK uh, embassy was with me at that meeting. Um, but you know, in terms of what we're, we're doing, we want to make sure that we've got you know, um, opportunities identified, areas. I think some of the work, particularly in our Berlin office, we're seeing the benefits of that, particularly on the, the investment and the business connections that we can make. Um, that's been, I think, uh, you know, we're already seeing, although it's, the, it's actually quite a fledgling network, the, the practical operation of having somebody to help coordinate um, across different agencies and uh, with us, is, I think, has been you know, very productive. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth, did you want to come in on this topic? Yes. Thanks very much, Convener. Apologies for, for coming in a, a few minutes late. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's really uh, uh, fascinating, the, the ex international relations aspect of, of this paper, and I, I do welcome the, the substantial increase in the budget of around 40%. Um, I noticed that um, you, you're keen to further intensify our engagement with our European neighbours and with the US, Canada, China, India, Pakistan and Japan the focus on education, business and culture, as you see in the paper. And I'm just uh, curious, uh, I, I realise you cannot uh, sp uh, spread yourself too thinly, but why these specific countries, for example, as opposed to, say, Australia, where there's very strong mm -hmm. links with Scotland, or even, uh, you know, growing economies, you know, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, South Africa, Nigeria. And I'm just wondering why those specific countries have been, are going to be the focus along with uh, European neighbours. Uh, I think Brazil and Russia, there are certain uh, political issues that would, uh, mm -hmm. I think, predicate uh, non, uh, our, our concerns about some of the same about Brazil, Brazil and many other countries. Well, I said Brazil. It's Pakistan, <laughs> you can say about that too. Um, Yeah, I mean, in terms of... Uh, it, it, most of this has been in relation to, I suppose, some of it was inherited in terms of, you know, there was always, a, you know, when we came in, the previous administration had uh, offices in Washington and in Beijing and also in Brussels. Uh, what we've sort of sought to do is to try and um, identify where we can expand, uh, reflecting our, our economic, the economic opportunities. It's not necessarily always reflecting a... Uh, I suppose, a historic diaspora, for example, Australia. There are economic opportunities. I've always wanted to do more in Australia, but I, again, as you're saying, you know, one of the, the criticisms of this previous, or the previous committee here was don't spread your too, yourself too thin. And we do have presence, SDI presence, but it's not necessarily government presence. Remember, this budget that we've got is about, I suppose, government-led, um, uh, government-to-government uh, relations and also some of the coordination aspects. So SDI, for example, do operate in Australia, and, and they operate, operate, I think they've got now... Uh, I think it's over 30 now different locations, but they're always looking and changing where they might be. China is quite clear um, in terms of the, the opportunities. It's now a top five investor. Uh, we've now got, uh, and again, part of the work that we've been doing as government is trying to achieve the direct air link that happened with Hainan, uh, the Hainan-Edinburgh-Beijing uh, link uh, last year, which, which again, very, very successful. So th there's obvious ones um, with the US and China and Brussels. Uh, with Canada, we think there's a lot of policy operations. So a lot of the decisions are about where we might have interest. I think some of the issues around climate change, working with rural remote communities, some of the agenda that is there, we think we can work on. And um, there's uh, probably untapped potential. So I think that's the decision there. There's a decision, different decisions for each one. Um, for example, in Dublin, we know that the government to government aspects are cr critically important. And there's been a complete step change, I think, in our 
uh, Scottish-Irish governmental relations, uh, particularly since 2015. Uh, that was a deliberate decision by the Irish government and ourselves. So in terms of the exchange between ministers, for example, that has definitely uh, increased. That's helping us. We've seen it already in terms of the operation of the Dublin office, um, economic aspects, but also in a lot of policy areas. Um, there's been good exchanges um, uh, to develop. So that, you know, that, that explains that one. Uh, as a Germany, particularly, there's obviously a strong... Um, uh, business um, uh, opportunity. France has always had that, uh, particularly food and drink, massively important. But also in terms of education and culture, um, we've got uh, cooperation in there. So I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's not, there isn't, you know, it, we, we are quite discreet and distinct within each of those as to where we can maximise it. Uh, but, you know, we've got an, interna an overarching international framework that governs um, all of our uh, international engagement and what we're doing but it is about making sure that Scotland has a strong presence where we can that we have to be quite selective and discreet as to where the, the opportunities are but in renewable energies in particular and in some of our um, areas that we can uh, exchange in policy terms you know, we are now uh, a, an invite of choice for different areas but we're now looking for example and looking at the uh, our development of our Arctic uh, policy framework and that's not just necessarily geographic, it allows us to, to, to exchange some of our experiences in terms of our renewable energy, um, for example, areas, our climate change tackling with other countries. So, you know, it's, I, I can't describe our whole, I suppose, international engagement um, strategy and policy in that answer, but that's why we've made the decisions that, that, that we have. But we, you're right, we can't be everywhere, and that means sometimes making hard decisions. I mean, I can understand your reticence about Russia, but, you know, China is <laughs> notorious for repression of religious and ethnic minorities. So, I mean, I would have thought that if there was concerns about, about one country in terms of human rights, there would certainly be concerns about others. But in, in terms of Arctic policy, that was what, I was going to come on to that. Who would that include, Russia being the biggest Arctic nation, obviously? Um, I'm just wondering, does that include the Faroe Islands? Um, does it include uh, Iceland and, the, the, and the, the, Scandinavian, the four Scandinavian countries? And you've said here that... Um, just to quote for the record, obviously, because it's written down here, but um, you say this will highlight the extensive links already in existence between our communities, businesses and civic society and help shape Scotland's relationship with our Arctic partners for years to come. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, the, there's obviously different different areas. There's the, the Arctic, Arctic Circle itself, there's the Arctic Circle Forum, um, the Arctic Assembly, there's different uh, bodies and, and organisations um, that exist within this area. We uh, hosted the first ever Arctic Circle Forum uh, in the UK uh, just last year, again, as the instigation of, of uh, my, my department. I think it was uh, um, at the invitation of uh, the former uh, uh, president of... Um, of Iceland. Uh, we, I attended in Reykjavik uh, last year. Uh, we were well, re well received in terms of your connections and that's why I think it's quite an, a, a very helpful forum is that uh, people, we were quite clear that Scotland shouldn't describe ourselves as, you know, apologising for necessarily wanting to be part of the Arctic. You know, we are, we are welcome near neighbours and they want us to be involved. I think that was the strong message. But you're right in terms of the range. So when I was there, I think I had, I was there for two days and I, 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 two and a half days, and I think I had 12 bilaterals. Uh, to give you a range, yes, we met with the Faroes, we met with West Or Nordic Council. Um, there was uh, d different re representations in terms of, obviously, Finland. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the different, you know, the, the variety of people we met, including, obviously, Icelandic uh, uh, ministers as well. But uh, if you think about the next uh, forum was going to be in South Korea and the next in, in China, the, the interests in some of these issues are beyond. Now, some of them are quite hard economic. So Russia, for example, when we heard from the Russian uh, former Russian ambassador to uh, the US. Clearly, there's strong interest both from Russia and indeed from uh, Japan in how you open up trade routes. Uh, but there are that, that, that brings with itself its own environmental concerns. So one of the things that we need to do and we need to think through is in terms of how do we make sure in terms of what we have to offer. And one of the things that we, we do have to offer, which I think there's a lot of interest in, is we've done a lot of marine spatial planning in relation to how do you operate... Uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, you know, wind turbines, and also fishing within the same, you know, very restricted area, and a lot of people looking at, you know, what other lessons that can be learned there. So, in looking at the Arctic, it's not just as I said a geographic; it's it's wider, um, because it helps us in policy areas to help connect with people who are all wrestling with some of the same challenges and interests. But you know, when I met with some of the, you know, the I met with the Premier of the um, Northwest Territories. Uh, and to hear him talk about the impact of climate change, meaning you know houses that have been built in frozen tundra when the tundra is no longer frozen, and all of a sudden people are watching the television and houses are collapsing, it's a huge, a huge, um, uh, you know, it's a huge, you know, I think uh, a very immediate, oh, and very personal afraid. direct.
Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm just concerned. Oh, sorry. About, yeah. <laughs> um, Annabel Ewing. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Turning to uh, initiatives to be pursued further to the new cultural uh, culture strategy, um, which I think is still being uh, uh, worked on, um, I note there was mention of the, the launch of the Cultural Youth Experience Fund, uh, which I think is a very exciting prospect. And uh, that's building on, of course, uh, important work carried out last year during the Year of Young People. Um, so I would just really be keen to have a bit more information, uh, an update about um, what the budget line for the fund will be, when it will be operational, how can people go about accessing it, what kind of activities will be covered, and of course to make a pitch from my constituency of Cowden Beath. Okay. Which you would um, expect me to do. All right. Uh, I'm not sure I can read the Cowden Beath bit, but uh, in, in relation to the budget line, it'll be it's in the other arts uh, line. It will. Uh, we haven't announced the the amount that that will be as yet. We're still. Uh, finalising that. Uh, we're going to do pilots on that. We've uh, identified probably the best way of doing that is to work with the creative learning networks that already exist and particularly working with schools in uh, more financially deprived areas to make sure that they can have um, the opportunities that others might not have. We're also conscious that, um, as I think we've discussed in this committee before, uh, transport issues um, it needs to be addressed in a lot of you know, a lot of these areas. That's the prohibitive aspect, and also following uh, points made by this committee. I think by Ross Greer, uh, we're not just focusing on primary; we're also looking at early secondary as well. Okay, um, that's uh, helpful. Uh, when, when do we expect to see some activity then on the ground further to this uh, operational from 1920 budget? So from 1920. Yeah. Okay, uh, the, the 2020. 19, sorry, 20, yes. yes you know, I've got, I've when got when, you, when yes. the money Working becomes backwards. available, we'll spend it, I think, is the, is the answer. Um, well, that's really helpful. I mean, obviously, um, you know, plans are still ongoing, but I would find it very helpful if I could meet with your officials at a relevant time to, to have a better understanding of what concretely is going to happen under this and how I can do my best for my constituency to see how we can marry the, the fund with potential activity in County Beath constituency. If, well, I, 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 I don't want to make promises for one MSP. I know, I've got 129, so I'm, I'm I know, but I've put in the first bid, so <laughs> okay. the early birds, etc. But I, I mean, it would be helpful to, to perhaps I can write in the yeah, first instance yeah, to obtain yeah. further information. Um, a, a second a brief question, if I may, on, on in the same area of activity. I note that there's to be continued support for Systema Scotland's mm -hmm. uh, orchestra projects in communities, including uh, that was why I was focusing because the word is including Govan Hill, Rappoth, Torrey and, and Dundee. I, I just wonder, does that mean then that there's a, cons a potential consideration of expanding Systema? Well, that's a matter to, to, to speak to the system about. Uh, we've, uh, the funding this year is 850,000 uh, from the other arts budget. Um, the, we've helped them in their work in you know, making sure they can be sustainable in their expansion. Um, uh, so we've um, helped them you know, historically over a period of time. Again, this, I think, reflects the importance of good relationships with local government, uh, because a lot of these initiatives have actually come from local government managing to also, and I think if you look at particularly um, Aberdeen is a good example, very strong uh, private funding. Uh, you know, this is a partnership area, and it's actually about places themselves saying, we want this. Um, so, I'll, I, if, dare I say, our, a lot of our support is capacity building for this, as well as obviously operational spend. That's very helpful, thank you. Thank you. Tavi Scott. Could, could I just check the, the uh, line on local government funding that you gave to Claire Baker? Because you said it was a real terms increase, but Spice say it's a 3.4% cut in 1920. Well, I would refer you to the evidence that was given by the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Finance to the relevant committees. In yeah, the but last I'd refer you to Spice. Yeah, I'm just saying is that the, you know, in terms of the the real terms increase, that's the you know that's the information. But Spice say it's a 3.4 percent cut, Cabinet Secretary. You know, I, in terms of these debates will happen, and if this is a if the if the issues about local government spending for on culture and tourism and related areas is an issue for this committee, the new budget um, process allows the committee, I think, in a debate... I agree. I entirely to, agree to with that. that. So. My point was that you said it was a real terms increase for local government finance well, and SPICE, referred... which is the thing that we as MSPs yeah. depend on, says a 3.4% cut. So I'm just trying to clarify what it is. Well... You know, in terms of you know ensuring that we get best value for money, there's a lot of spend in there, uh, particularly around 
uh, areas around social care. Okay. Health, so, it's so. really important that if we're going to make sure we maximise the combination of what we can do to help support areas, and that's a major one, uh, particularly in relation to, I do believe that health and social care, care the integration of that and the spend of that, uh, the delivery of that by local government is something that is part of local government spending. I, I, that's probably... I don't don't it, disagree yeah. at all. I'm just saying there's a... Okay, well, so, so the government doesn't agree with Spice. I think we've established that. Two questions I just wanted to ask. Um, Historic Environment Scotland have had an increase in their income generated um, from 57.1 to 59.7 million pounds. What's the... What's, uh, what's happened there that's allowed their income to increase? They've been very effective. <laughs> but, uh, is it visitors? Is it just more yeah, visitors I mean, going to their properties? Uh, yeah, so which is, which is, you know, one of the, areas that the, one of the ways I've managed to, to, to manage our budget is to, to work with Historic Environment Scotland, to work with them when they've got increased income, to enable them to, to be able to spend their income, but also to be realistic about what we need to do to help other parts of the budget. I would say that the, the increase in visitor numbers have been uh, really quite extraordinary um, and very strong. A lot of it is related, again, to, to see film um, tourism and other areas. Outlanders had a, a massive effect, etc. What I would say, and I think this is a point of caution, is that um, they are seeing flatlining, um, as indeed are other parts of the tourism. So they've had, in recent years, big increase. Uh, one of the things that we need to be very careful of is spend. And so there, we, we understand, and again, this is something we need to look uh, closely at, is not just in historic environments, Scotland, their shops, etc., but in other tourist attraction areas, uh, disposable discretionary spend by some tourists is, is, is actually flattening. So although that's a healthy position just now, that's a good position, it's not without its challenges. Um, across all, most of the portfolio spend in my budget goes on staffing by the different you know, national companies, collections, um, the uh, HES, for example, and the pressures for the budget. You know, we, and it's a good thing that we've you know, got a good, um, uh, reasonable, well, a reasonable settlement on, in terms of, of, of um, uh, uh, staffing uh, increases. But the pay increase will, is another pressure that Visit Scotland has, and indeed all the others will have to accommodate from. It's, no, indeed. But yeah. in specifically on Historic Environment Scotland, um, on the income generated, which has increased, is th uh, uh, do you have any kind of breakdown on, is that across the board in geographic terms? I mean, I know Edinburgh Castle has uh. just gone through the roof, but, but what about the more outlying areas of Scotland? Do you know wh how, is historic and, uh, how they would um, see that? Um, it's... Uh, I'm happy to get Historic Environment Scotland sure, to write to the fine. committee. Yeah. I, I can probably give you a summary from where, because I've asked the same questions. They can give you more detail. The, the more geographically remote to the centres where incoming, because it, it's incoming tourists that spend a great deal. Um, domestic tourists don't necessarily spend as much. Some different nationalities spend more than others, um, for example. Uh, but the, the, there is an issue about people then travelling elsewhere. We want people to disperse and spend elsewhere. But I would reassure you that, again, I think because of some of the fantastic promotion by Visit Scotland and elsewhere, you've got particular areas have been very, very strong. Again, a lot of it you know, related to Dune, you know, Dune Castle, for example, if you saw the figures for that, extraordinary. But again, that's part of Castle Lake, Outlander, etc. But I think in terms of detail for that, they would probably... And I'll, I'll ask them to, to write... Totally, something. that's entirely fine. Yeah. Um, the other one I just wanted to briefly ask was... Um, I can't find anything in the budget on Gla Glasgow School of Art. Have you made any provision in the next financial year for Glasgow School of Art? Uh, there has been spend in uh, previous uh, budgets for Glasgow School of Art. There's, there's no request from the institution themselves. Remember, it is uh, the Scottish Funding Council and the Higher Education Minister who would be lead on the institutional aspect of it. The reconstruction costs of the building. They've not asked for any funding from that. In we the next financial year at all? But they have said that they don't require. They, they, they are, if you look at their public comments, sure. they have said that they um, and anticipate that they would not request public funds uh, for that purpose. We have provided funded funding for uh, support, for example, for CCA. Uh, for example, in December, we, we managed for my budget and in the other budgets find more money to help them in their operational costs. Yes. But we wouldn't fund. Uh, we've, Funding for Glasgow School of Art, even on an institutional basis, in terms of what it might need for the building, wouldn't necessarily come from my budget. No. It would come from the higher education. Yes, but you're the capsec yeah. for, for culture, yeah. obviously, by definition, you have a very close interest in this issue. So, yeah. But the funding that we had and we provided for um, in the for uh, the, the, with the dreadful uh, occasion of the first fire mm. actually went via funding council. Yes, but but they sorry, just to be clear, they haven't asked for anything in the next financial year. That Not from so my far. budget. No. 
Or not from the government, though. In, well, in I can't board. speak for him. I can't speak for the funding council, but not from. No. Not would from would it budget. be possible just to write back to the committee on whether there's been any request to, from the, f to the government in general terms, just for because we've we'll, had an ongoing interest in this issue, obviously. So. I'll, I'll ask uh, Richard Lockhead, who's the relevant yeah, minister, right. to, to write okay. to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, convener. Good morning, cabinet secretary, and I do apologise for my. I've been a wee bit late this morning. Um, just the, some of the areas I wanted to cover already have been by colleagues, but uh, on the, the issue of the lottery uh, funding, um, they're, they're obviously the, the, the budget line um, is also decreasing. But I know that there has been an issue that's been around for, uh, for some time, and I, and I generally don't know if that issue has been closed off or not, and that was the, uh, the situation regarding the, the monies that were taken to actually help fund the London Olympics. And there was the, the issue of monies to then be repaid back uh, to the lottery. I don't know if, if, um, if you can provide some clarity on that. Please. I cannot, uh, off the top of my head, give you information about the operation of the, the London Olympics from uh, 2012. I do recall, however, um, attending the Joint Ministerial Committee um, at Westminster that involved the Welsh, the Northern Irish and ourselves. And that was a, a big hot topic, I remember, at Ministerial Committees then in relation to what had happened. I can't recall um, in terms of the resolution of that. It was it was the one issue that went to dispute resolution at that time. But this is this is some historic uh, position, so I would need to you know, find out more about what happened with that, that issue. Uh, if it's possible, just throw it to the committee. Yeah. That'd be helpful. OK, yeah. well, that's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jamie Green, I believe you wanted to come back in. Yes, if you don't mind. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we've talked a lot about culture and external affairs, but I'd quite like to focus on the other third and very important area around tourism. Uh, tourism accounts for, as you are no doubt aware, over £11 billion uh, to the Scottish economy. Estimates put up at around 5% of our GVA. Um, indeed, there are two and a half tourists in Scotland at any given time for every person that lives here. So it's a uh, a substantial uh, and important part of your portfolio. But do you think people might be surprised uh, that when they look at the overall budget that the government only uh, provides £45 million of assistance to it, which is a drop of 25% in the last four years, given that visitor numbers are increasing to record highs? It was a 15% increase in overseas visitor numbers last year. The numbers in terms of your allocation of your budget and the overall budget that you're given towards that industry is reducing, but the number of people coming to Scotland and spending money is going up. Uh, does, do you think that's a, a marriage that, that works? Uh, I'm not sure I actually recognise the a 25% reduction. In fact, I've well, really... in 2014-15, the budget was 60 over 60 million uh, in real terms, and this year, our forecast next year, will be 45. So I, I, that's 25%. I, well, I mean, I'll look at, I mean, obviously the 24 to 15 is, is before my, my time as minister in this area, but I know from the time that I've been in, in, in this post, I've managed to buy, I'm not saying there hasn't been some reduction, but it's not, you know, we've, we've actually... For the last three years. It's been, so. yeah, yes, I mean, which I think, bearing in mind I'm an unprotected part of the, the, the portfolio within government, I think that's a very strong position to um, to take and has been welcomed by the Chair of Visit Scotland, who's very, you know, you know wel welcomes the position. Um, there, in terms of the, the spend, we've managed to increase spend for tourism in terms of we've now got the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, which is spending uh, in terms of helping pressured areas. In terms of the operational uh, budget for, for uh, Visit Scotland, we've managed to you know, have that as a flat line. Now, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be straight with the committee. There are pressures there in terms of funding staff increases, in terms of the pay aspects, of, and that will be a challenge for them. But I don't recognise... I, you know, in terms of, I will come back to the committee in relation to what happened in 1415. But in terms of looking forward, this is the scrutiny of my budget for 1920. I think we've done a reasonable job in maintaining that position. Your, your point, your overall point about, yes, but you know, obviously there needs to be more spend in this than you know, in terms of. Yeah, of course. If you want to champion the the, the case for more spend in tourism, I absolutely welcome that. But I'll, I'll, again, I'll be realistic. As part of my role is to make sure that in other portfolios we maximise the spend on things that can help tourism. And the things that can help tourism is a is the rollout in relation to superfast broadband. Again, not the direct responsibility of the Scottish government; it's reserved to Westminster. But substantial spend in that, which will also help in an increasingly digitised 
um, world of promotion for tourism, etc. Uh, transport infrastructure, really important. Uh, marina, for example, marina investment at Fort William and other areas. Um, you're right in terms of the economic contribution to the sector. One of the things that we worked with the industry on, uh, with the Tourism Leadership Group, is this document, which is the economic contribution of the sector. And I absolutely agree with you that in terms of the reach, particularly the geographic reach, but also the importance, we can't underestimate it. But I would also say, if you look at again, um, and it's worth looking at the, the aspects of the city deals that are coming through on tourism, not in my budget, but from elsewhere, I can persuade, I can influence, I can work with local authorities, they're the ones that are coming forward with the asks. If you look at the... Um, the development of the, well, it's in development the Sterling and Club Manager one, but also the uh, Ayrshire Growth Deal, really important, for example. Uh, some of the funding that we can support might come from my budget, but we can help leverage elsewhere and we can work in partnership. Some of the stuff from south of Scotland, for example, in particular, it's a, a great combination between Forest Enterprise Scotland and ourselves, maximising budgets to improve mountain biking, forest trails, investment. So you're, you're right. You, would I like more money for tourism? Absolutely. But part of my job is to make sure we leave our cross government. So don't underestimate, and it's something that we can try and pull together. And I'm, I'm keen we do that. Is how we've managed to leverage in funding from other portfolios to help tourism. But I mean, on that, I mean, I, I, I totally understand your, your situation. You're working in an unprotected portfolio area, which you know, and, and trying to spread it out across your different areas of the portfolio. But tourism is less than 20% of the budget that you are given and, and you choose to spend less than 20% of your budget on tourism. So that's maybe the, the additional point that I'm making. And the majority of that budget goes solely on Visit Scotland. Uh, so it, whilst there is cross-fertilisation from other government initiatives which will yeah. boost tourism, I do accept those and that they are also welcome, it is a, a fact uh, that, that your entire tourism budget is swallowed up by a single agency and that has remained relatively flat over the last couple of years given, as I said, that tourism is 5% of Scotland's GVA, so it just doesn't seem to feel intrinsically like the appropriate attention and financial support that the industry needs to, to, to grow in the way that it's growing. Well, I, if you ask the industry, I think they've been, obviously they might want more funding, but they're very pleased at how, what I've managed to do with the budget that we have and the fact that I have managed to protect that. But, you know, Historic Environment Scotland, we've just heard the questions from Tavish Scott, I've got a, a huge contribution to make to the tourism sector and investment in that area. And again, I've managed to get capital funding for them as well in terms of the areas helping improving you know, the visitor experience. And, you know, for example, the Dune Castle, they had to move their shop because, of, uh, and they had to invest to expand that because of the increasing numbers. So, you know, tourism is everybody's business. So therefore it's my job to make sure that every part of government can help invest and, and, and do that. Would I like it all to be in my budget? Um, yes, I would, but that's not the reality of where it is. But you're, you're right in saying, um, in terms of, you know, I, I have to make decisions within my own budget, but if you want me to move in, and put more money into tourism, I'm going to have to cut some, you know, some other area. And I'm not sure, you know, the committee may recommend saying that we think you spend less on one thing and more on another, but that's what the com committee do. I've got to make my judgments. And I think, you know, by and large, we're, we're, we've got good, healthy f uh, visitor numbers, uh, more importantly, experience, but also what Visit Scotland can do is anticipate the future. They've just done a report on, you know, the demands of the, the next generation or this generation, young people, in terms of expectations and experiences. But I also uh, convene a high-level uh, leadership group on tourism that brings together the tourism uh, leads for Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and we'll also do the South of Scotland, um, working together with the industry itself so that we can make sure that we can work as leverage across government to make sure the spend is appropriate where it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just in conclusion, the uh, budget document for 2019-20 uh, commits to publish a new culture strategy for Scotland and that, that publication was supposed to happen at the end of 2018 and I wonder if you could update us on where we're going to see it. Um, well, we're working on it in 2019. I must say is the response and the engagement has probably been one of the most comprehensive in terms of um, government uh, consultations on strategies or developments. There were uh, over 280 responses, but they weren't just like responses to the questions asked, that they were really thoughtful and in depth and to respect the, the quality of the contributions that we've been given, uh, we're taking our time to, to make sure that we're giving them full consideration. Okay, thanks very much. We look forward to seeing it and our committee will certainly take a great interest in it when it's published. Can I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary and her officials for coming to give evidence today and we shall now move into private session. <laughs>